Good afternoon, everybody. It's kind of hot in here now, but we'll be cool later. I'm Sharon Jackson, and I am the British woman who had the vision of building an off-grid, bioclimatic, sustainable building in the middle of an olive grove on the top of a mountain on an island called Crete. I had a vision that if I built this amazing building, people will come from all around the world to come to learn what sustainability feels like. What is the emotion about sustainability? And I felt that uh, uh, the island of Crete was a perfect place for that to happen. So what I'm going to do this afternoon is share with you some of the light and some of the dark moments of bringing my vision into reality. And what I'm going to ask you to do is as I tell you my story, I'm going to ask you to notice, sense things that really appeal to you. Or some things I say and you go, oh, yuck. Or, oh, I love that. Or I feel emotional. Things that are meaningful to you. Have you all got bits of paper? Show me. Hey, bravo. You should all have two, one yellow and one orange. Keep them safe. Because at the end of my talk, I'm going to ask you to write on them. Don't write anything until the end. But basically, yellow will be light and orange will be dark. But keep, don't write anything yet, because we'll tell you what to do at the end. But I'd like you to pay attention to the things that I say in my story that could be in your story. That's the purpose of this. Are you going to do that for me? Lovely. So, you see that my title is Sensing Light and Dark. <clears throat> A lot of my work around sustainability is about sense-making. What happens in our sense-making processes that makes us do good things? And what happens to make us do bad things? Or mostly what happens in humanity, because I believe humanity is good, but mostly we're just lazy, aren't we? We just know the right thing we should do, but we just don't do it. Because I know I shouldn't eat so much chocolate, but hey, you know, I eat a lot of chocolate. I drink a lot of wine too. I know I shouldn't, but I do. Because somehow I deselect that, <laughs> because I don't want to stop doing those things. And sense making is largely about the stories that we have in our heads, the narratives, and the anchors that we have that define who we are. Who we are, what we do, what other people think of us, our behaviors, and how we make our decisions. So I'm going to give a little bit of an insight into my sense making, because I can't get into your heads, but I can share you mine, and you can see what things resonate with you. But before that, let me introduce you to my vision. Do you like it? Isn't she beautiful? She's lovely. So this is the European Sustainability Academy in the village of Drapanos. Any of you know Drapanos? It's a little village on a mountain very close to here. And you, if you can see Suda Bay, you have Akrotiri on one side, of, almost like a volcano. And Drapanos is the most iconic, beautiful mountain on the other side of Suda Bay. It's very beautiful. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, this is my anchor. This is my light. ESA, European Sustainability Academy, is my story. And I'm going to share about with, that you now, with, with you now in the hope that I might inspire you with your own story. But let me go backwards a little. <clears throat> I first came to Crete with my vision in 2007. The same year, I went to the Arctic Circle on a research program to find out about climate change. I went to Churchill, Manitoba, on the, in the very top of the world, it's called the polar bear capital of the world. Dendrochronology, nice Greek word, guys. Yes, I think so. So I was part of a research team taking cores from trees to find out the impact of climate change. What we found absolutely floored me, I can tell you. We found, and I was in the labs happily sanding these down and varnishing them, etc. We found that every single tree core we took from those trees in 2007 showed us Mount Pinatubu volcanic eruption from 1991 in Indonesia. Did you get that? We're on the top of the world. And every tree ring from 1991 showed the impact, the sensing of those trees of the volcano in Indonesia. It, for me, was like, wow. I kind of knew we were a closed loop on this planet. I kind of knew that we have the one sea, one air, one planet. But to see it like that is quite phenomenal, don't you think? So this happened, and at the same time, I came to, to Crete. And I bought my, my, my home here, 
and I started plans to build my vision here. Now, I'm going to be honest here. I nearly quit before I started. Because when I stopped being a tourist, and I saw the environmental degradation here in Greece, animal cruelty and neglect, problems with inequality between gender, I really thought, I don't know, this may not be the place for me. I don't think they're going to like me. I don't think I'm going to like it. It felt very dark for me and almost hopeless. That's how I felt, I'm being honest. But then I thought, well, change will come. And wouldn't I rather be part of change than running away from something that makes me feel uncomfortable and dark? So, 10 years on, let's have a little look <clears throat> how things changed. This is my village, Drapanos. This is where I chose to build my vision. This is almost just across the road from where I live. Do you know what it is? It's a burning garbage dump. Can you hear my throat? <clears throat> Can you hear my eyes are sore and I'm slightly coughing because of this? It's been burning for three weeks, guys. Three weeks, and it's opposite my, my house. Now, I'm, this is a dark thing for me, <laughs> I can tell you. It's very dark, and at the moment, no one knows how to put it out. I want to turn this into something light and bright. So I'm trying to work with all the stakeholders to educate and understand that this is toxic fumes. There is no way. Remember dendrochronology. Remember the volcano in Indonesia on the top of the planet. This is, this is a problem for the whole of Apokoranas, the whole of Crete, in fact. That, those fumes aren't just in Drapanos, are they? So I'm trying to make it light and trying to look for ways forward in a positive, elegant way. We're not there yet, but this is what I'm working on right now. Because if, if we abuse our environment, it abuses us back 10 times harder. A degraded environment is not a place for humans to have a nice, light life. And that's not just rhetoric. Isa, my building, is a living example of biophilia. Greek word? I do believe. So biophilia, if you don't know, is the theory that all humanity needs to be connected with nature. We're part of the system. We're not bolting on. We're not just come here, visitors, and go off to the moon at the weekends. It might happen in the future, but it's not happening right now. We are part of the system, and we need it. We need it to feel good. We need to feel happy. We need to feel healthy. So when the people come to my academy, they write in the book about how they feel. They feel safe, secure, healthy. They cry when they leave. They just feel liberated. They feel light. They feel creative. They go on to do great things. They particularly comment on the materials that we use. Issa is built of straw, mud, and wood. And we have earth roofs. So people talk about feeling like in a burrow, a womb, feeling safe. And my God, out here, out there, there's a lot of unsafe things happening in this world. So if I've created a place where people feel safe to think and contemplate, I feel my work is done in this world, frankly. So this is about biophilia. Now, I mentioned straw bales, and you can see there we're building the straw bales in 2011. Hmm, well, hasn't always been easy. 2011, straw bale building uh, workshop. 24 gorgeous people coming from around the world, paying to come to learn to build with straw bales. Guess what? In Drapanos, we had zero straw bales. They were sitting on a vehicle in Piraeus, waiting to get on, on the ferry, 10 days' time. We had no straw bales. And my gorgeous architects, lovely young female architects from Hanya, Antonia and Zeta, and probably some of you here know those two wonderful women, the beginning of their career, and certainly the first eco-building they designed like this, came to my house on the start of that workshop. <laughs> oh, I have to, I'm going to get giggles now, I tell you. Because we sat in my kitchen at the table, these lovely young faces sitting at me saying, Sharon, is it a problem that we have no straw bales? You know, I could tell they wanted an answer from me. I could tell. They were looking for leadership. They were looking for guidance. So what did I do? Hmm, I thought. I went to the other room, and I got this beautiful rock. Someone had given it to me in Australia. I don't even know what it is, but it's pretty. I can tell you that. And someone told me it was good for energy. So I said, Antonia and Zeta, sit down at my table. Let's hold on to this. You can imagine it, can't you? And they're thinking, oh, God, we knew she was a bit crazy, but she really is batty. So we're sitting there. We're holding this rock, all of us there, their faces looking at me for some wisdom. 
And I said, hold this rock because I have absolutely no idea what to do. <laughs> and that's what we did. We laughed. We laughed and we laughed. And with laughter comes light, doesn't it? Because suddenly all that negativity and that heaviness and scaredness went away. And you know what happened? 24 hours later, the straw bells came. They arrived. I won't quite tell you how, but we got them there. So everything was, went ahead. So you can see how my story is unfolding here now. And I told you, Isa is my anchor. It's my magnet for light. So today, at the end of my talk, I want to help you find your anchor and your magnet for light as you go through your lives. That's my objective here today on this stage. So start creating your story very early and make sure you know what you want in and what you don't want in. So Isa was built. 2013, amazing, amazing year. We just basked in light all that year. I was invited to speak around the world to tell my story about Issa Drapanos, this little village full of sheep and goats, frankly, and men that don't wash very often, but don't tell anybody I said that. I was invited to New York City to talk about this, and I happened to be in Athens with a friend having a beer, and we said, wouldn't it be so cool, you know, the economic crisis is biting, you know, people really need cheering up. What if we invited someone like Grammatic? Do you know who Grammatic is? Yeah, pretty cool DJ from Brooklyn. Plays, plays to thousands and thousands of people. So I thought, well, I'm going to New York. I'll ask him. And he came. And these wonderful people here, volunteers from this university, helped me make that happen. I tell you, people were surprised we got Grammatic to play on a mountain in Drapanos in a wooden straw building for 400 people. But no one was more surprised than me, I can tell you. It was a very light, brilliant time. The village benefited, the creek benefited. It, was, it, was, it did exactly what my friend and I said. It made everybody feel fabulous. We got grammatic to play in Crete. It was very wonderful. And do you know why he came? My story. My story. In fact, when we first asked him, we said, let's do it in Athens. And the, and the agent said, no, we want to do it at your place. The idea of playing off-grid, this gorgeous, gorgeous uh, environmentally beautiful, sustainable place with the, under the stars is what we want to do. It was my story, because they believed in what I've done, and Grammatic personally has an affinity with that. That's why that happened. The same year, we had African princesses. Don't forget, I'm on a mountain with sheep and goats. Okay, so this photograph, you can imagine, this is not what you see often in a Cretan village. <laughs> and when I take them to Diverna, it's hilarious, because they always dress like this. They're princesses. So these women helped me set up the Women Empowerment Awards program, and every year we recognize Cretan women who excel. Then came 2014. Ooh. 2014 was a bit of a dark year. I started off uh, at the beginning of the year having a bit of a health scare, which turned out to be nothing but it made me think about what do I want in my life and what do I not want in my life? Where is my light and where is my darkness? At the same time, someone stole money from me, I was blackmailed, someone affected my car to make it dangerous. Let's say it was not a light time. At the same time, the Greek government owed me, get this number, 220,000 euros. Nearly a million, half, quarter of a million euros. Now, I don't know about you, that is one big number of money. I was owed in FIPR from the building and some EU funding. Three years I waited for this money, and it didn't come. Now, I will tell you, at this time, around June 2014, I was ready to close the doors of my vision. I was ready to go back to the UK and give up. I'd run out of money. I don't, why, why do I want all this stress? Crete doesn't, you know, I just thought I was right in 2007. Crete doesn't want me. I'm not wanted here. But I went to Alunda. I thought about it, and I thought, Sharon, you're not a quitter. Who, come on, you know you're not a quitter. Get back. You're the only one that can turn this around. So I designed what I like to call a goddess protest. Dressed myself as prettily and goddess-like as I possibly could on a hot day. Sprayed myself with nice perfume, had letters sprayed with Chanel, Chanel number 19, and I took myself off to the Doi in Hanya, the tax office. <laughs> ha ha ha, you're with me, aren't you? 
I'd been there a lot of times before with an appointment. This time we didn't make an appointment. And guess who I took with me? A Milano photographer who takes photographs of women on the catwalk. And his wife, who's a, who's a, a designer. We turned up, you can see, we've just arrived there. Top left-hand corner, we're just arriving. I am shaking, really, I'm so scared. But thought, what can I lose here? I never got an appointment so quickly in the tax office ever before in my life. Straight in. But I didn't think it went well. <clears throat> and you see me on the, on the steps there, leaving. I'm crying because I don't think it's gone well. I got the money two weeks later. Then we thought, let's go for the rest of it. My accountant rang the other office. The office said, do not let her come here with a photographer. I'm like, oh, I hadn't even thought of coming with a photographer. Great. I'll be there on Monday for the, for the check. And if Monday doesn't happen, the photographer and I come on Tuesday. Oh, she said, we can't possibly get people to sign the check. No problem. Try harder. Otherwise, I'll see you on Tuesday. See me there? That check is 143,000 euros, ladies and gentlemen. I waited three years to get that money. It was rightfully mine. So a bit of Chanel number 19 and a Milano photographer will take you all the way in life, I tell you. So Issa lived on, survived another quitting phase, and actually more than lives on. We are thriving. We are basking in the light right now. That is me in February in Mumbai getting yet another award for our work, another award for Issa and Drapanos, another award for Crete, for the second year running at an amazing conference. We have relationships with people in Dubai, in India, in Australia. We have groups of people coming up to this tiny village of Drapanos to see the night sky, the Cretan window to the sky, to hear about mythology. We have people coming to test, taste Cretan natural treasures. We have broken into the cruise ship market. Groups are being brought up from Hanya up to a mountain with goats and sheep to come to see this anchor of light. That's unheard of. People don't come up to this little village. So I can tell you, we are basking in success. But, Allah, I know the darkness will come back. It will come, for sure. Because that's life, isn't it? But I have some tricks. I know I can do a few little tricks. I've tried them out and they've worked. And of course, I have, ha ha ha, this wonderful thing. I have the magic rock. I have my Isa, my anchor for light. I think the momentum, I, what I didn't realize I was going to do was create a movement for change. I do believe that's what's happening. And having the right people around us is also very important for getting through the dark times. And I feel that my, my journey has included getting the right people, laughter, and sticking to my purpose and my story. So, that's my story in 18 minutes. It's over to you. I'm going to hand to you, Anna, in a moment. But really, what did you... I hope you were paying attention, ladies and gentlemen. What did you notice? What did you feel? What really made you... Oh, that's interesting. Because, remember I told you, when I wasn't feeling very well, I, wanted to, I thought of, what shall I keep in? Light. What makes me feel good? What do I want in my story when I'm doing a TEDx talk in 10 years' time? That's my, that's my challenge to you guys. What do you want to be telling people when you're on stage about your story? And what do you want to kick out? People? I made some, I kicked some people out back then because it, well, they weren't serving me well in my vision. The lights are going to come up now. You have in your bag some pens and then stay, write your notes, stay seated, and then Joanna's going to tell you what we're going to do afterwards. We're going to do something very special. Quite a nice ceremony that I hope you'll enjoy. So thank you very much for listening to me.